Hi everyone, I'm just going to do a short video here and we're going to look at anatomy and physiology of pregnancy. I know you have all covered this and I know you know it, so uh, I hope you're not impatient with me, but I want to make sure everyone's on the same page and we pull ourselves through in a sort of a, a uniform fashion. So let's do this quick review together. Uh, these are really important words. I know you know them, gravity and parity, and they refer to number of pregnancies and number, uh, so not the number of times you became pregnant, and then the number of times you carried a pregnancy beyond the point of viability. So let's look at how we use them. Gravida, that's a woman who's pregnant, so she's gravida. Gravity is the actual pregnancy. Multigravida is a woman who's had two or more pregnancies. Multipara, that's a woman who's carried the pregnancies to a point of viability. Now, you don't have to have a live birth, you could have a stillbirth uh, or something else, but you uh, have to have carried the pregnancy to the point of viability. Uh, nulla gravida, that's a woman who's never been pregnant. And nulla para, someone who has, may have been pregnant uh, one or more times, but has not carried that uh, fetus to the point of viability. We're gonna carry on here. So when we uh, talk about uh, history of pregnancy um, um, for when we're doing an assessment, uh, fertility history and pregnancy history, we wanna look at the uh, parity, and the gravity and the parity. So parity is the number of pregnancies in which the fetus, or if you're carrying more than one, the, the multiple fetuses have reached viability. Remember, with parity, it's not whether you had a live birth and that a fetus survived, but whether you've carried them to the point of viability. Um, uh, when you're talking about uh, post-term or post-date, that's beyond 42 weeks. And you remember that um, a fetus is, is um, a normal uh, range is beyond 37 weeks, right? So at 37 weeks, you are term. Typically, we calculate your due date to 40 weeks, but anywhere beyond 37 weeks is full term. Beyond 42 weeks is post-term, or sometimes they call it post-date. Uh, prima gravida, that's a woman who is pregnant for the first time, and prima para, a woman who has uh, completed one pregnancy uh, to the stage of fetal viability. So just the first time you've uh, brought your pregnancy to the stage of fetal viability. Again, just a couple more times. Term, uh, remember, beyond 37 weeks, so from 38 weeks, the beginning of, the week, of week 38 to uh, the end of week 42. Viability is the capacity of that um, um, fetus to live beyond the uterus. Typically, we're looking somewhere between 22 and 24 weeks, and it's amazing how that number moves downward as technology enhances. Uh, so 22 to 24 weeks, though, beyond the last period, uh, and, and or fetal weight greater than 500 grams. Now, that's a little bit iffy when we're talking about uh, a mom who has gestational diabetes or diabetes in general, uh, type 1 or type 2 even, uh, where you may have a large um, uh, fetal weight for uh, gestational age. In Canada, it's important that we look at our Canadian guidelines. Typically, the healthcare team is uh, expected to resuscitate uh, uh, any preterm infant born at 25 weeks and beyond. Between 23 and 25 weeks, we're talking about very low birth weight um, uh, infant, and, uh, it's up to the parents to decide. And that would be a discussion typically that happens together. It may be dependent on how large the baby is, how well developed the, uh, the, the baby is, other things. Less than 23 weeks, we typically would think that you may not engage with resuscitative efforts, but I remember a lot of things impact this decision making, right? So how um, well developed the fetus is at that point, um, whether the fetus is making respiratory effort and has it looks like it has capacity potentially to survive, how big the fetus is, a whole bunch of other things. So these are just guideposts. Typically after 25 weeks, we engage in resuscitative efforts. Between 23 and 25, parents are involved in that decision-making process. Less than 23, often we're not going to be engaging in resuscitative efforts, but there are a lot of things that play into that. You know about this. Um, pregnancy test, it's the HGC, HCG uh, that we are looking for as a marker, and there are many variants of that to be very specific, but it's HCG we're looking for. I'm not going to ask you this, but it's an ELISA test, which is just a kind of um, enzyme-based test. Uh, and it's the same thing that you would do in a, a um, home pregnancy test. So let's talk a little bit about adaptations to pregnancy, right? Um, high levels of estrogen and progesterone have a big impact on a lot of changes uh, within the uterus. Uh, in particular, we're talking about that early uterine enlargement, and that results from that increase in vascularity, increase in 
blood vessels and that hypertrophy and hyperplasia. So they, uh, you have an increase in the amount of vasculature and a growth in the actual vascular itself. Um, and after the first trimester, uterine growth is primarily due to that mechanical pressure of the growing fetus. So the growing fetus within its home and the uterus actually expands the uterus. Um, at conception, the uterus is shaped like an upside down pear, and we all know that. During the second trimester, as the muscular walls strengthen and become more elastic, the uterus becomes actually more spherical, right? Uh, and globular in shape. And during the third trimester, as the fetus becomes longer, the uterus becomes more of an oval. So it's more ovoid in shape and extends right up into that abdominal cavity. Uh, and so it's remarkable that the human body can do all of this, isn't it? It really is just a, a you know, some kind of miracle of uh, that, that human organism that we can, that we are so adaptive to pregnancy. Uterine size, you know, we measure that by what we call that fundus height. I know you've learned this all before, and it's a rough estimate of fetal growth, right, as that uterus moves upward. After about the fourth month, uh, we start to feel contractions, which are known as Braxton Hicks contractions. Uh, they can help to facilitate uterine blood flow through the placenta. Uh, sometimes they can be mistaken for true labor, particularly as you move further on into the pregnancy. But what happens with the Braxton Hicks is that they don't increase in either intensity and they don't cause uh, cervical dilation. On the other hand, when you actually have premature contractions, um, some people mistake those for Braxton Hicks. So if you're not sure, we always tell a woman who's pregnant uh, to seek medical attention. If you're unsure about that, just go ahead and seek medical attention. Um, when we think of that uh, utero placental blood flow, that increases, so the blood flow to the uterus and the placenta increases as the uterine size increases, and that makes sense, right? We wanna nourish uh, the, the uterus and nourish the, um, the fetus through the placenta. Three factors are really critical in, um, uh, in identifying because they uh, decrease that utero placental blood flow, and that is low blood pressure, so we wanna watch for that low blood pressure, contraction of the uterus, and the position of the woman. So that's why we sometimes have the woman uh, turn over onto her side, right? When we've got pressure on uh, the vasculature, which is making it difficult to have blood flow into the, um, the placenta and the uterus. Cervical changes in a normal cervix include the softening of the cervix, and that happens about the sixth week of pregnancy. And that again is related to that increased vascularity, um, the hy hypertrophy, and the hyperplasia, remember? So increasing vasculature and the growth of that vasculature. And that's known as Goodell's sign. And the friability of the cervix, on the other hand, um, increases as well. And that means that when that cervix, let's say it's uh, scraped or touched, you may have some bleeding. And often we hear uh, pregnant women with some concern that they have a little bit of spotting sometimes after, um, uh, after having sex, things like that. The first recognition of fetal mo uh, movements can be as early as 16 weeks. Um, but often in your first pregnancy, it's interesting, often in your first pregnancy, it's not until the 18th week or later. That's not because the fetus isn't moving as much, but it's that idea of how do we recognize that feeling. It's often different than what people imagine it would be. Um, quickening is that flutter, and often <laughs> we can confuse that with gas. Uh, many women confuse it with gas. But that, uh, that's about fetal movement that's increasing throughout, right? Um, we know that there are changes to the vagina and the vulva. Hormones prepare the vagina for stretching uh, in labor and birth, and they cause the mucosa to thicken. Uh, the connective tissue needs to loosen, and smooth muscle uh, needs to um, hypertrophy to grow. That smooth muscle needs to, to uh, grow. And the um, vaginal vault right, needs to lengthen. Uh, and interestingly, this violet blue color from increased vascularity can be seen uh, by the sixth to eighth week of pregnancy, and that's called Chadwick's sign. And then finally, leucorrhea is a white, slightly gray mucus discharge from the vagina with a faint kind of odor, uh, just a musty odor. It's not a, it's, it's not a sign of an infection. It's uh, typically not um, uh, something that people would complain about terribly, but that is uh, due to the increased production of estrogen and progesterone. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about signs of pregnancy as we go through all of this. So when we talk about signs of pregnancy, 
often people think of um, uh, you know, nausea and other things. But it's really as we go through this system by system that we really uh, recognize that the signs of pregnancy are both the large ones, so loss of a period, uh, menstruation, although that can carry on even for several months, often mistaken uh, for a regular period when it's uh, some spotting as uh, hormone levels change minutely through the pregnancy. Um, uh, nausea and other things, we'll talk about that. Uh, breast tenderness, we'll talk about that. So all of those classic signs, we're going to cover as we move through all of these slides. Okay, and so here what we see is that as the fetus grows, that displacement of your internal ab uh, abdominal structures and the diaphragm uh, as that fetus enlarges at four, six, and nine months. And so what you see is that as that as your uterus grows and your and the, and the fetus grows, that there is that movement of your um, uh, uh, movement of your GI structures, and that impacts things like uh, nausea, inability to eat. Um, and other things, and also your diaphragm. So sometimes we see that uh, shortness of breath, particularly on um, activity like going upstairs and other things. And if you imagine that huge change in your body as you've got this large um, growing uh, uterus with a, a, a fetus inside, that there are not unanticipated uh, changes uh, related to where the space that that fetus is taking up. And here's just an exam a picture that shows us the height of the fundus by week. So at 12 weeks, you're not going to feel that, uh, that fundus, but as you move through the pregnancy, you're going to see that fundus move higher and higher. And by, um, uh, by pregnancy, it's going to be right there under your ribcage. So it's really um, very space occupying through that abdomen. So let's look at uh, some adaptations to pregnancy as we continue, and we're going to look at um, the um, breast changes. Let's start with that. They occur largely due to estrogen and progesterone, those hormone changes, and that includes things like increased fullness, increased sensitivity, and that heaviness that women describe in their breasts. The nipples and areola can become more pigmented and darker. Blood vessels can become more visible. So you can actually see those um, blood vessels in your breasts, often initially sort of as um, a shadow, but actually can become more, more prominent. Uh, and uh, many women may develop stretch marks as the, their breast size grows fairly quickly. It's important to have a properly sized blood pressure cuff for mom um, because the blood pressure can be affected by a woman's position. Uh, during the second trimester, during the second trimester, systolic and diastolic blood pressure decrease by about five to 10 millimeters uh, due to that peripheral vasodilation that's caused by hormones. We also notice that in this period, we often see women fainting. So a very common symptom of, uh, aberrant symptom of pregnancy may be fainting due to that change in blood pressure as we have uh, those blood vessels dilating, um, and particularly on change of position. Uh, BP should return to the first trimester reading during the third trimester. So it's the second trimester that can become the issue. Uh, blood volume does increase by about 1,500 mils uh, during pregnancy and 50% um, above their non-pregnancy levels. So that's about, uh, uh, it's largely um, caused by plasma and red blood cells that are increasing in order to uh, preserve the pregnancy, in order to nourish the, um, the fetus, uh, and also in order to prepare, if you, if you think about physiological adaptation in order to prepare for that, uh, for potential blood loss uh, during uh, birth. Uh, it's a protective me mechanism, uh, helps to perfuse the baby and develop that reservoir, uh, the reserve for labor and delivery as, as I just was mentioning. So we're gonna carry on here. Um, let's talk about the respiratory system. Oxygen requirements increase during pregnancy due to that acceleration in our metabolic uh, rate, right? So we have, we're increased in oxygen usage, uh, cellular oxygen usage. Also, the fetus requires oxygen uh, to dispel CO2. So elevated levels of estrogen cause the ligaments in the ribcage to relax, and that allows for increased chest expansion. Isn't that remarkable? Our body is so adaptive. A pregnant woman, a pregnant woman breathes more deeply and there's an increase in tidal volume. And so that's, a, remember, the amount of gas that's moved in and out of our lungs with each breath. Um, expiratory reserve volume, and so that's uh, how much volume is left after we breathe out, and residual volume decrease progressively throughout the pregnancy. And so our total lung capacity actually decreases slightly 
which is due to that um, chest wall and diaphragm elevation, right? So as the fetus grows, there's a, a diaphragm and chest wall elevation. We have a little, a slightly less um, uh, reserve volume and residual volume, right? So we're breathing in and out fully and there's very little reserve volume left by the end. Uh, our metabolic rate varies considerably, but it usually increases by 15 to 20% by term. And that can cause things like heat tolerance. When I was pregnant, I don't know how many of you have had uh, children when I was pregnant, I used to say the furnace went on and it stayed on th throughout pregnancy. But often one of those symptoms that we hear from pregnant women is that uh, profound fatigue. Acid-base balances, isn't that remarkable? Acid-base balances occur and that allows transport of CO2 away from the baby and oxygen to the baby. So those slight acid-base balance changes actually allow oxygen to the baby. Our renal system, um, we have anatomical changes due to hormonal changes, pressure from the growing fetus and increased blood volume. So later in pregnancy, uh, the ureter and the renal pelvis dilate and that allows for more urine uh, to be held here. And that can actually predispose the mom to kidney stones and very commonly we hear uh, moms uh, experiencing UTIs. So it's important to have that, uh, to always ask for those symptoms. Uh, you can also have that irritability of your bladder, that nocturia, particularly in the first into the second trimester where you're um, going to the bathroom a lot because you have that irritability. Uh, later in your pregnancy, you may go to the bathroom in the night because you have that very large baby and it's hard to, um, uh, to maintain, uh, to hold much urine in your bladder. Um, so it, uh, that urinary frequency that occurs early uh, in pregnancy is caused by uh, that irritability, the urinary frequency that's, that happens near term. So once lightning has, has occurred, is caused uh, by a different kind of irritation on the bladder. Uh, we also see functional changes in the kidneys, and that's to allow them to excrete the waste from the fetus. So isn't that remarkable? Though I, I keep saying this, but the human body is a remarkable machine. Okay, so let's talk about our skin, and I know you know all these things. Cloasma, that's what we see sometimes. That, uh, uh, layman's term is that mask of pregnancy, so that uh, darkening around uh, your in your areas of your face that looks sort of like a mask. Um, and the last one here, palmar erythema, that is a rash on your palms of your hands. It can be very irritating and itchy. Uh, when we look at the musculoskeletal system, the center of gravity, oh, maybe I'll just mention those, uh, striae gravidarum, oh my gosh, stretch marks from pregnancy, and linea nigra is that line down the center of your abdomen uh, that will go away after pregnancy usually, but sometimes you always have a little bit of a shadow there. Um, so when we talk about our mus musculoskeletal system, Remember that center of gravity moves forward and that causes a realignment of your spinal curvature, right? So that spinal curvature, which is, tends to be small uh, and becomes larger as you're carrying that weight in the front of your abdomen. And that can cause aching, numbness in, uh, numbness in your hands and weakness in your upper extremities, again, because of that change in posture. You'll see changes in posture and gait and uh, particularly uh, no, more notable as you get that slight relaxation and increased mobility of your pelvic joints. And that helps to enlarge the pelvis, getting you ready for birth. But often uh, we'll start talking about a woman who is um, walking like a duck or waddling a bit because there is that increase in the laxity that um, changes your gait. In terms of our neurological system, we see lots of sensory changes. In particular, we look at our legs as a result of the um, pelvic nerves um, we, uh, uh, along um, our spine. Remember, we've got that change in the alignment of our spine. A lot of women uh, can experience carpal tunnel syndrome from uh, that edema that they're um, uh, experiencing, particularly around the third trimester. Attention uh, headaches, so headaches are very common in pregnancy. Lightheadedness, remember we talked about that um, increase in um, uh, vasodilation and that drop, it's slight drop in blood pressure. So often we see lightheadedness, syncope or dizziness, and particularly uh, in change of position from lying to sitting, sitting to standing. Oh gosh, muscle cramps and tetany are terrible and often uh, uh, associated with electrolyte disturbances. And uh, for many women, they talk about uh, really debilitating Charlie horses that wake them up in the night uh, in their calf. And that can be really uncomfortable. Often um, there are some suggestions to eat a banana before bed, other things like that, if uh, potassium or magnesium or other things can cause it, but there's no real solution for that. It, it can be very uncomfortable. Uh, let's talk about gastrointestinal system. 
So remember, appetite uh, really fluctuates during pregnancy. The intestinal secretions are reduced and your liver function is even altered. So we have a, an adaptation that actually promotes the absorption of nutrients. Uh, so most people who are pregnant experience some level of nausea with or without uh, vomiting. Um, and it's thought to be related to the, that hormone HCG, which is a marker of pregnancy. Uh, in pregnancy, your bowel sounds are diminished. So often you see constipation as a result, and we would um, support a, a pregnant woman by talking first about um, dietary um, supplementation of fiber-rich foods. Uh, we also can see nausea and vomiting associated with that um, diminished uh, GI motility. Um, and and uh, again, uh, nutrition is the first avenue. Sometimes a pregnant woman may be given a um, stool softener to support that, not a laxative. Uh, blood flow to the pelvis is increased and we have increased venous pressure and that can contribute to hemorrhoids, both internal hemorrhoids and external hemorrhoids. Um, it's interesting that change in se uh, sense of taste can lead to uh, cravings. Gums, it's really important that a pregnant woman uh, have appropriate dental care during pregnancy. Gums can become swollen and spongy, which can cause them to bleed easily and that's related to estrogen. Uh, the teeth need more calcium, so it's important to keep those um, dentist appointments and make sure that your teeth are all right. Herniation of the upper stomach occurs in a small percentage of women at around seven or eight months, and that's because the, the um, uh, growing uterus really pushes against, remember that, uh, those abdominal structures. Um, increased in estrogen production causes a decrease in secretion of um, um, hydrochloric acid, and that can actually... Uh, uh, lead to an ulcer, ulcer formation during pregnancy. Um, and it's interesting as well, we think of the gallbladder. It's gallbladder is often distended in pregnancy due to uh, that decrease in muscle tone, and it has an increased emptying time and a thickening of that bile as a result. And because of that, so the gallbladder is not able to empty as easily, and you've got that thickening of the bile, gallstones are more likely during pregnancy, which is a terrible thing because we're not going to intervene typically during pregnancy for that. So again, we're going to look to diet and support. Um, abdominal discomfort can include pelvic heaviness and pressure. We have pain from those round ligaments on uh, the lower left or the right side, often um, gas pains, and again, some uterine um, contractions. Oh my gosh, we've done it. So I promised it would be quick and it is quick. And um, I hope that was helpful, just setting the stage for all of us as we move on to care of the um, uh, mom during pregnancy.